about uh, some uh, work uh, to appear and work in progress uh, with uh, Shruti, which is uh, our postdoc uh, at UC Davis and three of my students, me, Chantaro and Umo. And uh, okay, so here is the outline. So the kind of big goal of this program is to find some geometric picture for non-planar amplitudes uh, in n equals four super angles, n equals eight super gravity, uh, and uh, in general about how to capture uh, amplitudes which don't have uh, uh, color ordering and are not enlarged and limit uh, uh, in terms of some uh, geometric uh, constructions. Uh, and it is based on uh, the uh, on uh, the work in the last ten years on uh, scattering amplitudes in planar n equals four superreactors. And uh, I will repeat a lot of it. So half of the talk would be basically repeating uh, what we already know, maybe in some certain direction that I will use then to generalize uh, and uh, get some insight on the non-planar structures. Uh, I well, I heard that uh, you already had uh, many talks on this topic, but uh, anyway, I will uh, I will start very gently, uh, and uh, uh, just the main uh, kind of uh, take is that in this planar n equals four superangulus theory. So for physicists, they probably know what I'm talking about, uh, but anyway, it's certain very nice theory that we all like. Uh, we can uh, formulate uh, the question of calculating scattering amplitudes. Uh, using uh, cells in the positive Grassmannian, which are related to Playby graphs, which is the same as on shell diagrams, physics. And there is some nice unification and uh, uh, the whole problem can be nicely formulated in the language of amplitude Eaton, which I'm not talking about today. Yeah, because for the non-planar part, there is kind of nothing at the moment I can say about it. So in this talk, uh, we will take a certain uh, attempt uh, to generalize this story uh, beyond uh, planar limit, beyond planar play big graphs and on shell diagrams. And we will uh, use uh, uh, physics uh, approach to calculate scattering amplitudes called the BCFW recursion relations. And we will consider some uh, one version of it, which is normally not used because uh, 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 it expresses planar amplitudes in terms of non-planar objects. So normally we don't like it because we would, would like to preserve planarity, preserve symmetries uh, manifest, uh, which uh, are related to planarity. But now we will purposely not do it. And uh, uh, despite we will still talk about planar amplitudes, we will use different building blocks and they will lead to the non-planar positive geometry. And we will study these building blocks and see what we can learn about them and uh, eventually in future, these building blocks should be also the building blocks for non-planar amplitudes. But now we are expressing planar amplitudes in terms of non-planar building blocks. Why? Because here we have everything under control. We know what we are talking about. We know what these planar amplitudes are. So we are just uh, purposely using these other uh, building blocks. Okay, so I, I kind of a long motivation uh, to get there. So. Let's just start, uh, I divide it into physics and mathematical motivation. So on the physics side, what we are interested in uh, is the problem of scattering of elementary particles in quantum field theory. And uh, this is described by a mathematical object uh, called scattering amplitudes, which is a function, depends on coupling, depends on momenta, depends on some spin information, helicity for us, because we will talk about massless particles. And uh, in the standard way of doing it, we are using perturbation theory, which we will also use here. And uh, this requires that we are expanding uh, uh, along some, uh, in some small parameter G. And then we organize uh, this uh, scattering amplitude A uh, as uh, a series in G, when at the leading order, we have, uh, we have the simplest uh, dominating part or three level amplitude and one loop, two loop, three loop, and so on, because uh, the power of this G is controlled by the number of loops in corresponding Feynman diagrams. Feynman diagrams is a standard way how to, uh, uh, how to calculate amplitudes in the perturbation theory. Now, uh, this method of Feynman diagrams is uh, very general, uh, works in any, basically any weakly coupled field theory. 
but uh, it often obscures certain things, uh, certain things, including symmetries or simplicities that the final amplitude does have. So people in the past look for different methods and different ideas, how to reconstruct uh, these mathematical objects, these sparkling amplitudes. And one of them, kind of the most prominent one, is the recursion relations, recursive construction. And the idea is that rather than writing the amplitude as a sum of uh, Feynman diagrams, we write it recursively. We calculate lower point amplitude, and then we use this information to feed it into recursive formula to calculate higher point amplitude. And that turned out to be extremely effective. Now, uh, uh, kind of the most uh, important version of these recursion relations, before going too much details, is uh, so-called BCFW recursion relations. Uh, it's kind of the minimal recursion. And it works for quite a large of class of quantum field theories. There are some conditions that the theory must satisfy in order to work. And uh, uh, it does recurse the higher point amplitude in terms of lower point amplitudes, which are shifted in a certain way. Uh, but uh, we can actually continue this recursion. So now we are talking about this three level amplitudes. There is some generalization to loops uh, in, in this n equals four super diagonals theory, but uh, yeah, we will talk just about three level amplitudes in this uh, talk. And uh, we can recurse these three level amplitudes because recursively you recurse higher point in terms of lower point. So you can just continue the, this process until it stops. And it stops when you hit the smallest amplitudes, which are three point, when uh, you only scatter three particles. And uh, uh, in order to describe uh, these three point amplitudes, uh, 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 we use certain, uh, certain uh, kinematical data. Uh, kinematical description. Uh, so the external particles, as I said, uh, are described by momenta and some spin information. Uh, we will be interested in massless particles uh, where the mass of the particle is zero. So if the particles are on shell, p square equals m square is zero. And in four dimensions, instead of the four momentum p, we can use two spinners, lambda and lambda tilde. And this is called a spinner helicity formalism. Uh, so in any, case, in any case, in the end, uh, it's boiled down to the fact that all information about uh, the physics uh, is given by two set of spinners, lambda and lambda tilde, two dimensional spinners. And for each particle, we have one spinner. And uh, using these spinners, we can build some uh, kinematical variants called angle and square bracket, which are just epsilon contractions of uh, these uh, spinners for two different particles. So these will be the objects that you will later see uh, in some of the formulas. Now, why is it useful? Uh, uh, the useful thing is that uh, uh, for these three point amplitudes, the simplest ones, uh, uh, these uh, uh, spinners uh, are uh, very convenient to solve for the momentum conservation. So that's one of the conservation law in physics that the sum of external momenta is zero. And we also talk about massless particles. So the squares of the uh, momenta are zero. E1 square, P2 square, P3 square is zero. And as it turns out, this set of equations is extremely restricted and there are only two solutions. And therefore we associate to three point amplitudes just based on the kinematical solution, even without talking uh, about any particular theory. And in one solution, all these lambda spinners are proportional and the lambda tilde spinners are not. So they are, uh, they are generic. Uh, they do satisfy some condition, but they are not proportional. And in the other version, all the lambda tilde spinners are proportional. So we have these two, the uh, momentum conservation and uh, these on-shell condition only allow us these two solutions. Okay, this is independent on theory. So we can, uh, when we will graphically represent these amplitudes, we will use these two different blobs, uh, uh, white and black, depending on which solution we are talking about. Now, if you look at a specific theory, uh, we have some formulas for these three point amplitudes. So for the theory we are interested in, uh, n equals four super angles, which is certain supersymmetric extension of QCD, theory of strong interactions. Uh, we will have some formulas. And uh, for this uh, three point uh, wide amplitude, 
all the lambdas are proportional, so the result only depends on lambda tildes. As you can see, these uh, brackets are the contractions of lambda tilde spinners, while for the black vertex, for the black uh, three-point amplitude, uh, all the lambda tildes are proportional, so the result has only uh, the, uh, the angle uh, brackets of lambdas. Okay, so now back to the recursion. Uh, so uh, the recursion allows us to express the amplitudes in uh, the higher point amplitudes in terms of uh, these three point amplitudes, if we do the recursion all the way down. And uh, there is some procedure how to do it, but in the end, uh, uh, we are getting uh, these objects on the right, which are uh, graphs. Uh, which only have uh, these black, uh, these black and white three-point vertices, and they stand for these three-point amplitudes. So each graph is uh, uh, is calculated as a product of these three-point amplitudes living in each vertex, where all the legs, uh, external and internal, are on shell. This is a very different than uh, Feynman diagrams, where the internal legs are not on shell; they are off shell. They don't satisfy p square is zero for that momentum in that leg, but these do. So these are very different diagrams, and we call them on shell diagrams. And they are building blocks for amplitudes. For some simple amplitudes, and amplitude is one on shell diagram, but for more complicated, you get a sum of them. So you can express in these recursion relations the amplitudes as a sum of these on shell diagrams. Okay, so that was the physics uh, uh, motivation. Uh, now, uh, the mathematical motivation is that the same diagrams appeared uh, in the past in combinatorics and algebraic geometry as play big graphs. And uh, uh, I'm sure they are useful for many things, but in particular, uh, they, uh, 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 they can be used to represent the permutation of n labels. So it's a graphical way how to represent the permutation. And they will also correspond, which will be more important for us, uh, they also correspond to the cells in the positive Grassmannian. Okay, so first about the permutation, this is something we will not then use later, but we would like to use it. So hopefully there is some generalization of this picture to the graphs we will talk about uh, in the second part of the talk. But uh, here, uh, uh, what, what is known is that if you take a planar, a play the graph, and it must satisfy some condition, but be reduced, but not talk, hopefully some of you might know what, what is a reduced graph, but uh, uh, it's not that important for us. Uh, but these, uh, so some special subset of these playbook graphs uh, uh, rep uh, rep uh, represent uh, permutation or in one-to-one -one correspondence with permutation modulo, uh, some identity moves, which I will mention just in a second. And uh, you draw a graph and uh, there are certain rules uh, how to read off the permutation. So if you start with external leg uh, one, uh, then uh, you, uh, you take a path through the graph and you land on some other external leg and that's where the one goes in the permutation. And then there is some simple rule, ah, there should be black here for the, for the I don't know why the black disappeared. Uh, so, on, uh, so if you go through the graph on the white vertex, you turn left, on the black vertex, you turn right. And, uh, and uh, it's a non-trivial, you, know, you can get just some, uh, you, you don't need to have that necessary permutation, but you do. That's what was proven by Alex Posnikov before. Okay, and uh, the graphs are not unique uh, because uh, you can change the graph and you still keep the same permutation. And uh, there are certain identity moves uh, which change the graph, but the, the permutation stays the same. And you can either merge expand uh, the uh, pair of uh, vertices of the same color, as you can see in the picture, or once you see any square in the picture in the play big graph, you can just flip the white and black uh, vertices, and also it doesn't change the permutation. So there are some examples how you would change the original graph, but you don't change the permutation. Okay, so the second connection is uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the positive Grassmannian. So uh, the positive Grassmannian is uh, some subspace in the real Grassmannian GKN, uh, where all ordered minors 
main minors are positive. So k by k minors are positive. So we consider a matrix k by n in here in this example three by six modulo g of three where all ordered minors uh, three by three minors are positive or non-negative. Yeah, we allow that they are zero uh, for uh, uh, when we go to some lower dimensional cell. Okay, so this is a very interesting uh, space. Uh, it has very interesting boundary structure. It's uh, topologically a ball. Yeah, and there are just many interesting things about it. Uh, we will not use all of them, but uh, yeah, we will do a certain uh, survey on what we need later. Okay, now the boundaries uh, of this space uh, is when uh, we send uh, a consecutive minor to zero. So all the ordered minors are positive, like uh, one, three, five minor is positive, one, four, six is positive. But uh, the only minors we are allowed to send to zero to go and, and boundary of this space are the ones which are consecutive, like one, two, three, two, three, four, three, four, five, and so on. So here for G36, G plus 36, there are six of them. Now the top cell of this positive Grassmannian is nine dimensional because we have three by six metrics modulo GL3. So we have 18 entries minus, uh, minus nine uh, for the GL3 fixing. So we get nine independent uh, uh, entries. So it's nine dimensional. We call it a top cell when no condition is imposed on any minors. And now we go to a boundary, we impose a condition, we set one of the minors to zero and we get lower dimensional cell. So this has eight, uh, this has six, eight dimensional cells. And then we can go to seven dimensional cells when we impose two conditions. And then it becomes more interesting for the general. So it's not only enough to say which minors you send to zero, there is some additional information that you have to give. For example, for this exam, uh, for uh, this G36 positive Rasmania, if you set minors one, two, three to zero and two, three, four to zero, there are two solutions. So you have to further label which one, which solutions you have in mind. Both of them are possible. Both of them are different seven dimensional cells. Okay, uh, now the connection with play big graphs is uh, that uh, the play big graphs are related to the cells in the positive Rasmania. Uh, Again, uh, there, it's a module of these identity moves. So different graphs, which are related uh, by these identity moves correspond to the same cells. And uh, uh, for example, this graph is associated uh, with a cell in G plus two five. Uh, there is uh, an easy way how to read off what is the N and what is the K of uh, that Grassmannian. N is just the number of external legs and K is related to this number of uh, black and white vertices. Uh, so in this case, uh, the K is two. And uh, the prescription how to do it is that we have to label the graph and then we will read off the entries of the, uh, of the metrics, in this case, two by five metrics uh, using uh, variables of the graph. And this is called a boundary measurement. And uh, uh, there are two ways how to associate variables. One way is to associate the variables uh, associated uh, one way is to add variables associated with faces. These are called face variables or with edges. These are called edge variables. Here I am doing it with the edge variables. You have to also add uh, so-called perfect orientation. You have to add arrows on all legs. And uh, then uh, uh, on the external legs, you have certain arrows incoming. These are sources. Here the legs one and five are sources. And uh, we will go to sinks, which are the external arrows, uh, on, uh, the arrows on external legs outgoing. And uh, we look at the path and we read off, uh, we read off the path as a product of all the edge variables along that path and we sum over all paths which are possible. So if you can see from one to three, if you go through the graph, uh, there is only one path and uh, it only, uh, it uh, only carries the alpha six edge uh, variable. So the entry will be alpha six, which you can see here in the matrix. And if you're going from one to two, there are two different paths. So you have to sum over them and get alpha one plus alpha two, alpha six. That's the first, uh, that's the entry on the first row, the second entry and so on. So, 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 so you just fill the matrix. Uh, now, this is a particular, this is a G25 Grassmannian, it's a top cell. 
there is no condition imposed uh, on the miners. And uh, now this is just the way how to parameterize the Grassmannian, but uh, the important connection to the positivity is that there is a choice of signs of these edge variables uh, such that all the ordered miners are positive. So indeed you are getting a cell in the positive Grassmannian. You have to fix the signs of these edge variables or phase variables in case we did it with phase variables. And then all the miners are positive. So the, so the play the graphs gives you a parameter, positive parameterization of a cell uh, in the positive Grassmannian. Okay, now the boundary structure, uh, uh, we set uh, the consecutive minor to zero, uh, which sets the edge variable to zero. And this is a very nice interpretation in the graph because it erases that edge, which variable we set to zero, okay? So for example, we can send minor three, four to zero in, uh, in uh, this matrix. And uh, this can be done by setting the alpha four edge variable to zero, which just means that we remove that edge. And the resulting play big graph is a play big graph for that uh, co-dimension one cell. So uh, uh, to this five dimensional cell in G to five. Okay, so uh, the uh, play big graphs provide a very nice stratification of uh, this positive Grassmannian by removing edges, setting uh, the edge variables to zero. Okay, so uh, uh, the play big graphs give coordinates and provide stratification of the positive Grassmannian. Now the question is, is there any useful connection to on-shell diagrams, which were the graphs we introduced in the beginning uh, in the context of physics, which look the same, they were the same, but well, just the graphs were the same. So is there any useful connection? Okay, so, uh, uh, and there is, uh, and uh, uh, the question is posed in the, as following. So for the same graph uh, in physics, uh, we, con uh, we calculate a function, which is given a product of three point amplitudes in, the, uh, in each uh, vertex of this graph. And uh, this function, uh, this on-shell diagram, the, the, the on the function associated with the on-shell diagram is a building block for scattering amplitudes on one side. And on the other side in mathematics, we constructed this C matrix, uh, which is a cell in the positive Grassmannian parameterized by the edge variables or phase variables of the same graph. And now the question is, can we connect these two things? In other words, in physics, we would ask the question, can we calculate uh, the on-shell diagram using uh, uh, using uh, this uh, uh, the story about the positive Grassmannian. And yeah, and the answer is yes. And in fact, the same function uh, that we got as a product of some three point amplitudes in quantum field theory, uh, we can get as a logarithmic form. So a certain integral over a D log form on all edge variables just d alpha over alpha for all edge variables. Uh, so this is a form, but now we integrate it. We will not do any integral in the end, but uh, we consider this form and certain delta functions, which purpose is to solve for these alpha variables in terms of lambda lambda tilde, which were these kinematical variables, uh, which, uh, which describe the external legs and uh, the scattering. And, uh, now uh, we think now about these lambda lambda spinners geometrically, and uh, the lambda uh, has uh, as an object has two labels. Uh, uh, one is uh, just the spinner label one and two, so we'll think about it as a two plane in n dimensions because we have n of the particles, so we can live in this n dimensional particle space, and in that case, it's a two plane in n dimensions. The lambda tilde is also a two plane in n dimensions, and the C matrix is a K plane in n dimensions, just by definition, it's a Grassmannian. And uh, 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 the momentum conservation, which we will write in physics, says that the lambda and lambda tilde plane are orthogonal. Yeah, so uh, writing the sum of external momenta being zero in this lambda lambda tilde language means that uh, these lambda and lambda tilde planes are orthogonal. Now, this is a quadratic condition because it involves both lambda and lambda tilde together. We think about it as a condition on entries of lambda lambda tilde. 
Uh, and the C matrix linearizes this quadratic condition. So instead of talking about uh, what is the relation between lambda, lambda, tilde, we talk about C matrix and we say that uh, the C matrix contains lambda and is orthogonal to lambda tilde. Once we say these two statements, uh, just uh, being written in terms of two delta functions, uh, this imposes that lambda and lambda tilde are orthogonal. Okay, uh, so uh, these delta functions are very natural uh, from our point of view, and uh, uh, they reproduce uh, the momentum conservation, and furthermore, they solve for the free parameters of the C matrix. Uh, and uh, there is exactly uh, two n minus four of these delta functions. So these delta functions can solve for two n minus four parameters. And this two n minus four will be important uh, number. So, okay. So uh, uh, having these on show diagrams, let's play the graphs. Uh, they correspond to the cells on the positive Grassmannian. If the dimensionality of the cell is bigger than 2n minus 4, then the C matrix has some unfixed parameters, yeah? because adding these delta functions fixed some of them, but not all of them. If the dimensionality of the cell is less than 2n minus 4, then uh, we didn't have enough delta functions. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, we had too many delta functions and not enough uh, uh, three parameters in the C matrix, and we are getting some more conditions and now on the lambda lambda tilde. So now the lambda lambda tilde are constraints themselves. We are imposing more conditions on them. This is all possible. These are perfectly fine diagrams and uh, perfectly reasonable and important. But the ones which will be relevant for us is then the dimensionality of the cell is exactly 2n minus 4 which means that all of the parameters of the symmetries are fixed. All the edge variables are fixed in terms of lambda, lambda, tilde, and there are no additional constraints on lambda, lambda, tilde. And these are exactly the ones which will be relevant, uh, these on shell diagrams for the PCFW referred to relations. Okay, so when we, uh, for one example, this example, we perform this integral, which as I said, there is no integral to do. We are really thinking about uh, uh, solving uh, from the delta functions uh, for these parameters. Uh, so it's like integrating dx over x and delta x minus x naught. Uh, so all the, this integrals is exactly of that form. And uh, using this, pre this, uh, this prescription, we just uh, re, uh, re-derive uh, the kinematical formula we would know from physics. And in this case, it's just this single function of so-called Taylor factor for 5.3 level amplitude. Okay, uh, any questions so far? Yeah, so this is, I guess, for most of you, just a uh, uh, review of known things. So uh, now we will go farther to look about uh, these cells in the positive Grassmannian in a geometric way. You would like to, instead of thinking about the C matrix, we would have to get some uh, geometric description. And this is something we which will generalize to the uh, cases of our interest later. So uh, the Grassmannian is a k-plane in n dimensions, but we can read the matrix in an opposite way. So uh, we now look at the columns of this matrix and we think about them as coordinates of a point. And we would like to do it in projective space. So for each column, we can factor out the overall scale. And uh, the remaining thing uh, are coordinates of a point in PK minus one. Okay, so for us, uh, the, uh, the K by N matrix, uh, the Grass, uh, this Grassmannian matrix uh, describes a combination, some configuration of N points in PK minus one. Okay, so thinking about these columns. Now for the simplest case of G2N, it's when it's two by N matrix, this will be N points on a line. Right? It's N points in P1. And uh, the positivity of uh, all the ordered minors, in this case, two by two minors, will force uh, uh, these endpoints to be ordered on this line. Yeah? So the top cell of uh, G2N, of positive Grassmannian G2N, uh, can be interpreted geometrically as n ordered points on a line. 
Now, if we go to a boundary, we have to send one of the minor to zero, the, uh, the consecutive minor, like pi i plus one. And setting this minor to zero means that we merge the adjacent points i and i plus one into one point. So they are now, now they are merged. OK, now we can go to a second boundary when we send two of the minors to zero. And as, as I said before, sometimes there can be more solutions. So if you send i i plus one to zero, i plus one, i plus two to zero, there are two solutions. In one, all these three points are merged together, i, i plus one, i plus two. But the other solution is that the i plus one point is completely removed, yeah? which in this uh, 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 in uh, this way of writing it, it means sending this lambda to zero. We just completely erase the point. Yeah. And yeah, and we, uh, these are two different sets. OK. Uh, OK, now uh, the second, and this, this was the first thing. So we will think about this configuration of points. The second thing is that this can be also nicely encoded in uh, this Diop form. So in this connection to physics, we first took the play the graph and we associated a Diop form in all the edge variables. And then we dress it further more with these delta functions. We solved for the variables. We got some expression, some function of lambda lambda theta. So let's just look at this Diog form before we are doing any dressing. Uh, so this is uh, just the Diog form in all edge variables, the alpha over alpha for all alphas. Now, uh, this depends. Uh, the, what the alpha variables are depends exactly how we label the graph. There are different ways how to label the graph. And they just correspond to different gauge fixing of the GL2 of uh, this uh, cell in the positive Grassmannian. There is an equivalent way how to write this form, which is a GL2 invariant, when instead of any alpha variables, uh, we directly put their minors. Yeah? So this is an equivalent way how to do it. We, we take the form over all entries of this two by five matrix, modulo GL2. So we are not fixing the GL2 yet. And then the form takes, uh, then the form has this, uh, 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 has uh, this uh, numerator, there is a simple numerator, it's just one. And in the denominator, you can see the product of all uh, consecutive minors. And these minors are exactly the first boundaries of, uh, of uh, that, uh, that Grassmannian cell. So sending one of the minors to zero, as we said, is merging points. So we can take this form and take a residue and then uh, we get a form for the lower dimensional cell. Yeah? And this is all very nice geometric interpretation because looking at this form, we immediately see what the boundaries are. Now, one thing which is not manifest here, which was manifest in uh, the, the uh, gauge fixed way, how to write uh, the, uh, the D-log form, is that in this way, it's not that obvious that the form is logarithmic. In other words, if we start to take residues, we always find only sim uh, simple Holes. Yeah. Uh, now, if we take this uh, GL2 invariant form and plug the explicit, uh, explicit parameterization of C matrix using the boundary measurement, we would again reconstruct just the DL form in terms of uh, in terms of edge variables. So they are completely equivalent. One is gauge fit, the other one is not. Okay. And uh, so for general G2N form, uh, for the general G2N top cell, we can just get this simple form uh, with uh, this uh, consecutive minors uh, being in the denominator. And in physics, once solving uh, for these delta functions, these delta functions in this case, uh, which relate the C matrix to lambda lambda tilde, are especially simple. And they just force the C matrix to be a lambda directly. So the C matrix is 2 by n. Uh, uh, two by n matrix. Uh, it's a two plane in n dimensions. The lambda matrix is also a two plane in n dimensions. And the, these delta functions forces them to be equal. So in this case, uh, uh, if we calculate uh, this function, uh, kinematical function, it directly uh, just turns from one to the other. And this is a famous part Taylor factor for MHP amplitudes. OK, so now uh, we will look more closely at, uh, so the G2N is not that interesting. It's just too simple. But we will look closely at G3N. And for G3N, uh, this is a uh, configuration of endpoints in P2. 
Now, uh, the positivity of the three by three minors uh, give us convex configuration. So if you just draw it in a plane, all these points, one, one two, three to the end, must uh, be in a convex configuration. And uh, now sending uh, uh, the consecutive minor to zero forces the three points being on a line. So sending a minor one, two, three to zero forces the points one, two, three being on a same line. Uh, if we count the number of parameters, the top cell is three and minus uh, nine dimensional because it's three by n matrix. That's three n entries minus nine for the GL3. But as, as I said before, for us, the interesting case, the one we will look at more closely, is two n minus four dimensional because these are the these, these are the cells in the positive Rachmanian we will need for three level amplitude BCFW recursion that we care about in physics. All the other cells are also important, but they are relevant only for loop amplitudes, not mostly relevant for loop amplitudes, not the, uh, not the three level amplitudes. So for the G3N, we have to impose N minus five conditions. Yeah? So it's co-dimension N minus five cells that are of our interest. So for G36, which is the thing on the board, it's one condition. So indeed, uh, the cases when uh, for six points, when we consider, when we impose one condition, so are the ones that are relevant for us. In particular, if we do this BCFW recursion relations, uh, and uh, we do it in terms of these on shell diagrams, we get three on shell diagrams for six point NMHV amplitude, which is just n equals six, k equals three case. And these three on shell diagrams correspond to three eight dimensional cells in G36. And uh, these are the corresponding configurations. Right? Yeah. So we're writing, I just called, uh, I just write D mu. They are not that important for our discussion. Now, uh, uh, and you see some kinematical expression. It has some, what we would call physical poles, and it has something called spurious poles, which will eventually cancel uh, once uh, we sum all three terms. Okay. Now, uh, for the general uh, BCFW cell uh, in a G3N, uh, the configurations, the Grassmannian cells that we get uh, are codimension five, uh, 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 sorry, codimension uh, N minus five. And uh, they would correspond to N points on three lines. So this is what we will get as the configurations. So we will have N points on three different lines. So this is the general cell. Uh, uh, how we would represent here. And again, uh, once we uh, take the D log four, solve for, uh, solve for the parameters of the C matrix, we would reconstruct an object called R invariant, which is very important for physics. It has some uh, dual conformal symmetry and so on. So, so we like it very much. And uh, importantly, the only thing we show up in the BCFW are kind of a special subset of these R invariants. Uh, the general R invariant depends on five labels, and this one only depends on three labels. It depends on like an origin one, and then I and J. So, in uh, so what is the interpretation in BCFW? Only a subset of all on shell diagrams slash playback graphs do appear, uh, and uh, uh, they do correspond to configurations of endpoints on three lines. The general R invariant, which means that arbitrary G3N uh, on show diagram or play the graphs uh, would correspond to the configurations of endpoints on five lines, not three lines, but five lines. For BCFW, we are only getting a subset of them. But yeah, they are similar. Yeah, it's just that this is more special being on endpoints on three lines rather than five lines. Okay, so uh, now uh, uh, let me... Uh, mention quickly some uh, new kinematical approach, how to bypass uh, this step of solving for uh, the parameters of C matrix. So this is what I uh, just said. Yeah, this would be the standard way how to get uh, this R invariant expression or for the higher K, some more general Youngian invariant, uh, writing the deal of form solving for alphas and writing it as a, a super function. There is also some super component of lambda lambda tilde. Now, uh, there is a quicker way how to do it, uh, which in the first step realizes uh, that uh, starting from BCFW, uh, 
the, the function that we would like to get is almost a product of two amplitudes, two MHV amplitudes, two G to N uh, geometries. And uh, then there is some shift, which does something more. Uh, but uh, you can actually go back uh, to these configurations of uh, uh, six points in uh, P2 and label some shifted uh, uh, points P and six hat, which show up in the recursion. And uh, okay, so, so make it short. Uh, this uh, this con uh, the kinematical formula for uh, this argument can be also written as a product of three MHV amplitudes, which means uh, these part Taylor factors, which involve these shifted momenta. Now, this is trivial for the cases uh, where the BCFW term really comes from the factorizations of uh, two MHV amplitudes, but for a marginal BCFW term, where we are getting uh, these uh, configurations of endpoints on three lines, uh, this is uh, not that obvious, or it's not obvious at all, uh, but uh, yeah, we have a proof that you can write it like that. So uh, what, what is the meaning or what is the interpretation? It means that uh, despite these are configurations in G3N in the Grassmannian, you can still think about it in this lambda lambda tilde space, yeah? which in the original picture is not clear because the lambda lambda tilde space only enters once we solve these Uh, still, we can just think about uh, each of these lines separately as a small G2N, and all on all on each of these G2N, write a part Taylor factor and then take the product of these three part Taylor factors. These part Taylor factors will all be involve uh, some uh, shifted momenta Q1 and Q2, which uh, we have to calculate, and there is a simple formula for that. So this is certain way how to kind of do a localization in G3N in terms of a collection of G2Ns. Yeah, I don't know if it has any mathematical interpretation, but in this kinematical space, yeah, right. it just works. Okay. Is okay. this related to- We will to... use it uh, for the non-planers. So I, I'm just mentioning it here. Can I ask a question? Uh, it's not that important for the main story. Uh, okay, so we finally get to the non-planer uh, on shell diagrams, slash play big graphs. And uh, the big question, yes, there is a question. Uh, was this phenomenon somehow related to MH? Question. Can you hear me? Can you unmute yourself? I am unmuted. Uh, uh, ah, sorry, I don't. I am. Yeah, can you can you say it again? I. Can you hear, can me, you now? hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Uh, I was asking, I was asking if, if the phenomenon uh, on the previous slide was somehow related to MHV rules. No, it is not. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because the MHV rules uh, is a different thing. There are some uh, references. It's more related to Feynman diagrams. And this is something else. Yeah, I don't know what it is exactly. It just means basically that if you look in G3N uh, and you know that the cell uh, localizes these endpoints on three lines, you can kind of zoom on all, each of these lines separately. Yeah. Also note that uh, normally in the recursion relations, we would think about the amplitude as a product of two MHV amplitudes with some shifts. This is a product of three MHV amplitudes. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. It doesn't seem to be related to anything what we saw before. It seems that there is just some way how to parameterize the G3M, which trivializes the C dot lambda, uh, C perp dot lambda, C dot lambda tilde condition somehow trivializes them such that we can just solve for kind of the parameters of each of this line directly in terms of lambda lambda tilde. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. So uh, how general is this phenomenon? Does it, it happen higher? It's for GKN as well. Yeah, it is just more complicated to think about GKN because it's higher dimensional, but for GKN, these BCFW cells would place endpoints on uh, how, how many lines? 2K, 2K minus three lines in a higher projective space. And it does work as well there, yeah. So uh, it is something very general that you can basically write uh, the any Youngian invariant, any Youngian invariant is a product of MHV amplitudes. Uh, there is something which I don't say about the super function. There is a super function in the numerator. So 
I'm skipping that step, but kind of the denominator structure is just MHV amplitudes. Yeah. Uh, but note that uh, that uh, there are these extra points. Yeah. Oops. There are these points Q1, Q2, and uh, uh, in for higher K, there will be more of them. Yeah. So it's MHV amplitude, including these points, which make the result not holomorphic. Because if it was just MHV amplitude in terms of external lines, it would be holomorphic, and that's wrong. Yeah, because the R invariance also depends on lambda tilde. But all the dependence on lambda tilde is through these points Q1 and Q2. They come from just angle brackets of Q1 and Q2. So, uh, yeah. I did like the reference spinners here somehow. No, no, it's not reference. These are not reference. They just are external uh, momentum. Oh, sorry. Okay, they're determined in terms of. Yeah, directly solved in terms of external momenta. Yeah. So this reproduces the R invariant. If you do MHV diagrams, you don't get R invariants. You get some references. Yeah. So it is not the same. I don't know if it is related. It doesn't seem to be, but uh, uh, yeah. Uh, OK. Great. Yeah, so Matteo has a question. Um, so is there a way to understand this by uh, uh, taking the image of the uh, of the cells into kind of momentum freedom order in order to derive the phenomena. So like you can map cells in the Grassmannian K command into some Grassmannian GG commands where the lambda lambda is the same thing. So you understand what the image is. Uh, yeah, yeah. So Matteo is asking about relation to the momentum of the hedron, which lives in the lambda lambda tilde space. Maybe now, maybe this is possible. I will okay. I, I made some comment about the amplitude hedra in the end, but it will be just that we should do it in future. Uh, but here, the important thing is this Q one Q two. It's like these uh, these extra points that you have to introduce. So. Uh, these like geometric in Grassmannian are intersections of these lines, but this is in Grassmannian, yeah. So, uh, but these points are some kinematical points in the lambda lambda tilde space. So, uh, if this is understood, what these points really are, then I think, uh, yeah, if you can make any sense of these new points in the momentum amplitude hydra language, yeah, that, that that would explain it or give some insight. But. Uh, uh, yeah, but you have to introduce these new points. Yeah, and they naturally live, they naturally exist in the Grassmannian. And you would have to somehow take the, to do the image in momentum amplitude here and see what they are. Yeah, so no, definitely. If you, the, ampli the momentum amplitude hydron language is eventually important for something I will not talk about, which is like the D log forms. In order to write the D log form, okay, well, maybe I will say a few sentences here. So, uh, you can also write a D log form for uh, uh, these uh, uh, these cells, and uh, normally the, the way how you would write D log form for the R invariant is you just start with the R invariant as D log forms in all H variables. But now the H variables becomes uh, functions of lambda lambda tilde. So the D log forms exist, but are not that nice. They are complicated. You just have to solve for alpha uh, for these H variables. Now, in this language, we can actually write the R invariant as a D log form only in terms of lambdas. But these lambdas include uh, these cubes. Yeah, so they are holomorphic D log forms, but they also involve these special points. In other words, the only dependence on anti holomorphic data is through these points Q1, Q2. Yeah, uh, so there is like a minimal pollution of anti holomorphicity in the story. Now, in order to check it against uh, if these are the right D log for, because uh, if they reproduce the right expressions, one needs to uplift it to the momentum amplitude hydra language. We, at the moment, we don't know how to do it otherwise, even comparing to D log forms. So it's possible that the language will be eventually useful also to understand why this picture is correct. Yeah. Uh, okay. Let me. Yeah, yeah, let me. Right. Okay, good. So, uh, so now about non-planar, we, we will use kind of the same uh, way how to calculate uh, these functions also for the non-planar. So uh, non-planar on shell diagrams uh, or play big graphs. So here is the question. Is there any analog of the cells in the positive Grassmannian for non-planar 
on child diagrams. I don't think the non planar uh, on child diagrams slash play graphs haven't been studied that much. There was a little bit, which I will mention. Uh, now, the thing is that you can take the graph, you can label it using edge variables, you can do the boundary measurement, and you can construct the C matrix. That's not a problem. That works as well. The problem is that there is no positivity. So fixing the signs for alpha doesn't give you anything for the minors. Yeah, the minors are not positive. Yeah, it just seems to be some C matrix in GKN. However, apart from this positivity, many aspects of the planar play the graphs are unchanged. For example, if you send an edge variable to zero, you remove an edge. So it really looks like you are doing a stratification of something. There are boundaries of this space, and uh, you can, uh, you can uh, characterize them using uh, removing edges. You get another uh, play the graph, non-planar. And eventually, you get actually a planar one. Once you kind of remove enough number of edges, it planarizes, and then you get a planar play the graph, and then the story about positive Grassmannian kicks in. So eventually it crosses that line and it becomes a positive Grassmannian. So now the natural conjecture, or maybe a question is, uh, is there any cell or some subspace in, uh, is there an interesting subspace of GKN, uh, some G star KN, uh, which is associated with non-planar play the graph, non-planar, uh, arbitrary non-planar play the graph. And uh, you can also uh, equivalently ask this question, is there any geometry of endpoints in PK minus one, which you would associate with, uh, uh, with non-planar, uh, with this non-planar graph, which would give you that Grassmannian, uh, that Grassmannian uh, picture. So uh, we can ask this question for G2N and this is solved, but it's just too simple. Yeah. So if you have G2N, we know that it's endpoints in P1, so endpoints on a line. And now the positive Grassmannian says that these endpoints are ordered, one to n. OK, but if you consider endpoints on a line, they are always ordered in some way. So endpoints on a line, you can always decompose it into just a collection of all possible orderings of these endpoints. Yeah? So the, the space can be just triangulated in terms of small positive Grassmannians yeah? with different orderings. Now, if you look now at the non-planar graph for G to n, you will figure. You will eventually learn that yes, uh, the 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 graph corresponds to a Grassmannian geometry, and it is just a union of different G2Ns with different orderings. Yeah, and there is some nice story that this is already quite old uh, with these people that we figured out uh, how to start with the graph and how to give. Uh, the collection of these small positive Grassmannians and how to write a form is just a sum of part Taylor factors. Yeah, so there is a lot of nice stories about it, but the G2N is kind of too simple uh, for uh, to see what is how it generalizes for higher k. Okay, now uh, for G3N, we have endpoints in P2, and now it's obvious that just the collection of all different orderings is not enough. Yeah, because the Positive Grassmannian means that these endpoints, uh, when they are ordered, uh, it means that they form a convex configuration, like the one here on the picture. But if you consider the gener general G3N, okay, the points are just completely scattered. There is no ordering, nothing like that. Now, no convexity. Okay, so, uh, but our question is about these uh, uh, on shell diagram slash play big graphs. So, is there any geometry we can associate it with them? And now uh, we will not look at all play the graphs, but just the ones which show up in the BCFW recursion relations. Okay. And the method, uh, how uh, we will determine what the geometry is, is called the non adjacent BCFW shift. So this is this weird version of BCFW we typically don't use because we don't like it. But here it's very useful because it allows us to open the window to this uh, non, non planar geometry. So, uh, so for the physics uh, perspective, the non-adjacent means that uh, in the BCFW, we are not shifting adjacent legs, but non-adjacent. And this necessarily gives us, once you do it geometrically in terms of on-shell diagrams, it gives us non-planar on-shell diagrams. Okay. Now, uh, the same procedure that we use to this kinematical trick, fast track in the planar case, we do here in the non-planar case. Okay, so uh, 
We start with the BCFW term here on the left. There is an onshore diagram we immediately draw once we recurse to three point vertices. It's non planar, as you can see it. And now we can directly associate a non, uh, non convex, I would say here, non convex configuration. I call it non planar geometry because it comes from the non planar graph, but non convex configurations of points. So, uh, anyway, uh, I don't have much time. So, this is uh, the configuration that you get. It looks almost like the one before when you had uh, these six point on three lines, but you see that it's not convex. Yeah, the point six is kind of off. Yeah, it's on the other side. Uh, so that's what you get. And yeah, you can calculate the, the form. And it's some new form. It's not an R invariant. It's the, it's not that much different, but uh, yeah, it's a different. Uh, yeah, the form is not the same. Okay, now what about the geometry? So in the planar case. Uh, the, the first one, uh, we know that uh, the, for one particular cell in G3N, the points one, two, three were on the line, which means that the minor one, two, three is zero, and all other minors were positive. Now, looking at this configuration, uh, it changes. Yeah? The one, two, three is still on a line, so one, two, three minor is zero. Now, all minors are positive except few. So, minor four, five, six is actually negative. And minors two, five, six, and three, five, six don't have a fixed sign. Okay, so this is a definition. This is uh, uh, invariant way. Yeah, the way how I drew these pictures kind of much depend what I choose as an origin, how I draw it exactly. But uh, the set of these inequalities is a kind of invariant way how to define the cell. So this this defines some eight-dimensional cell in G three six. Yeah, not a positive grass mine, it's not positive anymore, the miners, but some eight dimensional cell. And now, if we want to do the boundary stratification, we would just do the same thing as we did before. We start to merge points, we just start to put them on a line and so on. And in the corresponding uh, play the graph, it would uh, mean to erase edges and do the usual stuff that we would do in the planar case. But now it's not planar. It's clear that eventually we would hit planar. For example, uh, once we move point six at this intersection point to the right, now it becomes a convex configuration, yeah? which means that we actually erase the edge, which made the diagram planar. Okay, anyway, we can do it for all these BCFW terms. And uh, yeah, sometimes uh, we get uh, these edges, uh, this convex configuration, sometimes we get non convex. Uh, there is some general solution for these non adjacent BCFWs, what type of configurations you get. But okay, this is the general configuration. So we have before uh, endpoints on three lines. We still have endpoints on three lines, but uh, they are not convex. So some of them are kind of, some of the points are kind of off, yeah, are on the other side. And yeah, if you look at it, you can easily write what are the, which minors are positive, which minors are negative. Yeah. Now there is a question. Does this have any combinatorical description? We know that for the positive Grassmannia, there was a permutation we can associate with each of the cells. Now, maybe there are two permutations here or something like that, uh, some modification. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, so these are the, the guys that we studied and which are relevant for these BCFW recursions. They are two and four, two and minus four dimensional configurations in G3N, not in the positive Grassmannia, in this G star 3N that uh, we don't know what it is in general, but we know what are these lower dimensional configurations. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, yeah, so maybe I, I'll skip that. Uh, so this is about the physics um, in the, in the play, uh, for these planar configurations, we have these R invariants. They are very nice because they have some Youngian symmetry uh, of planar n equals four super Young mills. They make it manifest. Now the question is with these uh, uh, non uh, non adjacent BCFW, they give these configurations. There are some new expressions. Uh, I we would call it non planar analog of R invariant. Uh, they are very similar to R invariants, but they are not. So they, the question is, do they have some particular symmetry? Uh, because these will be also natural building blocks for non-planar amplitudes. Yeah. Uh, here they show up in the expansion of planar uh, BCFW, but eventually if we do really non-planar amplitudes, this will be like coefficients of polylocks in the for higher loop uh, non-planar amplitudes. Now, um, there are some nice 
is here, un uh, unlike uh, in the uh, R invariant case, there is some important numerator, which is necessary there to cancel double poles in the denominator. Yeah, anyway, I, I think I will skip this story, but there is one important thing is uh, that uh, despite uh, these expressions are not R invariants and they correspond to these non-planar configurations, we can use uh, some trick uh, called, uh, it's not a trick, but it's very known, KK relations for, the, uh, for each of the lines separately. And we can rewrite uh, uh, the arbitrary, uh, arbitrary distribution of points on a line as a sum this is at the level of forms, so at the level of expressions, as the sum over expressions when we fix two of the points being adjacent and we sum over some permutations of remaining points. There is some shuffle product of the remaining points. Okay, so what it means that for this configuration on the left, in the bottom left that we had, that, uh, that was our result of this non-adjacent BCFW, we can actually write it as a sum of uh, these uh, adjacent configurations. So we can write it as a sum of R invariants with different orderings. Okay, so these non-planar R invariants are still quite special because there are sums of planar R invariants with different ordering, but some particular sum. Yeah, so it's not a random sum, it's a very special sum. Okay, this will be not true for general uh, non-planar on-shell diagram. The ones which goes beyond BCFW. This is only BCFW, so the ones which go beyond BCFW will, will be not true. So the last thing I would like to mention, so this is something in progress about non-planar top cells. Because in mathematics, so in physics, we like these two and minus four dimensional configurations, but in mathematics, the fundamental things are top cells, yeah, not these lower dimensional cells. So now the question is, uh, what are the non-planar top cells? Or that, what are the top cells associated with non-planar uh, play big graphs? And is there any geometry for them? Now, fortunately, these top cells have been classified by these people for G36. So only for G36, they drew all play big graphs slash on-shell diagrams for the top cells. There is like 27 of them. And they wrote forms. They wrote these uh, GL, uh, GL3 invariant forms. So, uh, this is the data they provide. They provide uh, the form. And uh, from the denominator of these forms, we can figure out what are the first boundaries, co-dimensioned one boundaries. So this is the one which corresponds to a planar top cell. So you can see these uh, uh, consecutive minors in the denominator. So from that, you can figure out what is the configuration which has exactly these, uh, which has exactly these boundaries. And indeed, this is just a convex configuration. Okay, now you can do it for the ones which correspond to non-planar play big graphs. And the forms look different and you can try to figure out what is the configuration of points which has the co-dimension one boundaries corresponding to the, uh, to the poles of these expressions. Anyway, and we did it uh, for some of them. So you start to get configurations so like that. So these are not convex anymore, but you just get, uh, Point, yeah, you get configurations of points which are not convex, and you can find the signs of all minors, and some of them are negative. Yeah, and uh, yeah, we did it for a couple of them. Yeah, here you can also see there is some configuration where point five is somehow in the middle of that configuration rather than on the outside. So again, uh, this is uh, some uh, this is some non-convex configuration, and we did it roughly for the half of uh, the. Uh, half of the on-shell diagrams they have. Sometimes they are even more tricky because sometimes the boundaries are not just being like three points on a line, but two points and some extra point which comes from intersection being on the same line and so on. So we can get very complicated things. Now, the question is, again, what are these, uh, what is it geometrically? Is there any combinatorical prescription? And what is special about these configurations? Because the play big graph single them out there is just definite number of non-planar play big graphs. There is like 27 of them for G36 and no more. It's not infinite, it's just 27. And these must be some special subs subspaces in G36, similar to the positroid, to the positive Grassmannia. Okay, so uh, being few minutes over time, let me just say that we identified uh, some non-planar positive geometries in BCFW recursion relations. Uh, there is some story about holomorphic D-log forms I didn't have time to talk about. 
and these non-planar are invariants. Uh, uh, from the physics point of view, we had these two n minus four dimensional cells we cared about, but uh, there is a uh, parallel mathematical questions about the top cells because they are fundamental. Uh, uh, we use some data for G36, but of course the question is for let's say G3n and general, what are these uh, non-planar top cells? What is the combinatorics? Yeah, what is special about them? Can we describe them in the same way as the positive Grassmannian? It seems like that because in the positive Grassmannian is just one play big graph, and these guys are also play big graphs, and they are very similar apart from this positivity. Uh, and now uh, the, there is also a question we try to address, but uh, so far uh, we don't know much, uh, which is how it's related to the amplitude hedron, because eventually, in the case of planar n equals four. These guys are just building blocks. All these play big graphs, all these on shell diagrams. They glue together in a bigger object called amplitude hedron, which is the geometry for the actual scattering amplitude. Yeah, not the building blocks, but the whole thing. And there is a version in the momentum twister space called amplitude hedron and momentum amplitude hedron in the lambda lambda tilde space. And uh, very minimally, uh, these, uh, these uh, non Convex configurations and these non adjacent DCF W cells should triangulate amplitude hedron. As it turns out, they don't triangulate the original amplitude hedron because they are non planar, non adjacent. So the momentum twisters don't play nicely with them. But uh, it's likely that they do triangulate somehow the momentum amplitude hedron in some new way. Yeah, not the way which the normal DCFW doesn't. So maybe there is something in interesting to learn about. Now, the final thing uh, is uh, that uh, what I'm trying to actively do is to figure out what is this picture for gravity tree level amplitudes, because the pictures are the same. Once we leave the planar world, uh, uh, we are in the complete non-planar world, uh, and uh, that's where the gravity lives naturally, because gravity doesn't have any ordering. However, the biggest uh, problem here is not about the geometries, but it's about replacing the DOC form with some new type of form which would reproduce gravity amplitudes rather than Yagnos amplitudes. Uh, there is some progress on that, but it, this is a hard question. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let's uh, thank the speaker again. And um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask now. Uh, if for some people, if, it's, if you want to ask any question. Yes. Um, seem like they do follow the same or like follow the rules for web diagrams, but maybe because there's some extra like simulations there, which how you can really do different diagrams to make it not just like I'm just curious what it is. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. We did the yeah, so so the 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 yeah. Uh the thing that we did here so far was, yes. Ah, okay. So there was a question if uh, these uh, non uh, non planar play graphs uh, were, if you look at them in the context of web diagrams. Yeah, and I was just saying that uh, so far what we try to do is just to kind of do a catalog of all of them with these positivity conditions. So uh, yeah, starting from uh, so not, yeah, is the for us, the diagram itself was not very useful because we didn't know what to do with the diagram. But once we had the form, we knew what were, uh, what were all the first boundaries. So we just tried to write, draw the configuration when the first boundaries would correspond to the denominator of that form. Yeah. So, and uh, once we draw the configuration, we can figure out what are all the signs of the minor. So this is kind of an invariant way how to uh, how to describe the symmetries for us, the cell or in something in a Grassmannian, not positive. Uh, you see, there is a negative sign here. Uh, but I don't know what to do directly with the. What is nice about the diagram as the play the graph? Yeah. So uh, uh, like, what is the question that I would like to answer there for the graph? Yeah. Here at least I have a question. What what is how do I characterize the symmetries? Yeah. What are the positivity, negativity? What are the signs? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I don't know what is the right question about the graph. Yeah. What would like to see? Like to see for the graph. 
I would like to calculate permutation or something else or what to do directly with the graph, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but yeah, definitely there, there certainly can be. There can be good characterizations of the graph that graphs directly in terms of yeah, some combinatorics, yeah, that I bet you don't know. Are there any more questions? We can also continue informally after since you were over time. So <laughs> okay, <laughs> the, um, let's uh, thank the speaker again. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so and also see you next week. We'll have uh, uh, Karen Yates coming and uh, uh, we have a hybrid seminar again and then Bert Stromfell is coming the week after. So it's going to be a good seminars. And uh, thank you very much and uh, see you next time.